Welcome to this video assignment. United States imperialism reached a feverish peak in the island of Cuba and will lead to the Spanish-American War, which is the subject of this video assignment. As one of Spain's oldest colonies, Cuba was Spain's major export market. It also developed a trading relationship with the United States, especially for sugar. In fact, Cuba traded more with the United States than it did with its mother country of Spain. Now, Cuba had revolted against the Spanish many times during the 19th century, but to no avail, they had always failed. Southerners had looked at annexing Cuba before the Civil War for obvious reasons, one more slave state, but the idea went on the back burner with the South's defeat in the Civil War. Until rebellion broke out on February 24, 1895, over the tariff that took sugar off the duty-free list. You might remember this from Hawaii. Sugar prices collapsed, putting Cubans out of work and anxious for rebellion. rebellion rebellious Cubans staged guerrilla warfare against Spanish troops, utilizing hit-and-run tactics on trains and plantations. In 1896, Spanish king sent Spanish general Valenero Butcher Weiler y Nicolo to Cuba to put down the uprising. Nicknamed the Butcher, Nicolo adopted a policy of gathering Cubans behind Spanish lines into detention centers to keep them from rejoining the insurrection. At some of these detention centers, a combination of tropical climate, poor food, and unsanitary conditions quickly produced a heavy toll of disease and death. Most Americans supported the Cuban rebels in their revolt. In fact, Cuban tactics reminded Americans of their own revolution, whether it was American or Texan. Also, public opinion was driven by yellow journalism, so named for Richard Occult's Yellow Kid comic strip in newspapers. It is a sensationalized, yellow journalism is a sensationalizing of the news in order to sell newspapers, sell ads, etc. Yellow journalism is also the impetus behind newspaper wars. In the 1890s, there was a major newspaper war in, the, in, the, in New York City, held between William Randolph Hearst and his New York Journal, and Joseph Pulitzer and his New York World. You may be familiar with Pulitzer if you've heard of the Pulitzer Prize. These newspaper wars were up depicted in Orson Welles' film classic, Citizen Kane. Now, the Cuban rebellion was tailor-made for yellow journalism and this newspaper war. William Hearst, nicknamed the Chief, first sent Stephen Crane, guy that wrote The Red Badge of Courage, and then later sent Southwestern artist Frederick Remington to Cuba to cover the rebellion. When Remington got to Cuba, he took a look around and saw that the butcher's policy was successful. He telegraphed the Chief, and said, all is quiet, and there will be no war. Hearst's response, Remington, please remain. You furnish the pictures, and I'll furnish the war. Now, Pulitzer, for his part, didn't send any notable correspondent, but he kept the story of the rebellion on his front page. This is important, because President McKinley didn't necessarily read the journal, but he did read Pulitzer's New York World. Now, in that, back, getting back in 1896, President Cleveland, he refused to intervene in the Cuban rebellion, although he tried to protect American rights in Cuba. Mediation was offered by Cleveland only in terms of direct involvement. Congress passed a resolution that endorsed the recognition of the rebels on April 6, 1896. With this, Cleveland offered to cooperate with Spain in granting the Cubans self-government. President McKinley's platform in the election of 1896 supported Cuban independence. In return for peace, Spain offered Cuba their independence. But this is not going to stop the Americans, who were energized by their sensationalist newspapers and, after 30 years, finally ready to go back to war. Thus, on January 25, 1898, the USS Maine arrived in Havana Harbor on a conference call. 
On February 9th, Hearst Journal published the Delome Letter. The Delome Letter was correspondence from the Spanish ambassador to the United States to a friend in Havana. In it, the ambassador called William McKinley weak and a bitter for the admiration of the crowd, besides being a would-be politician who tries to leave the door open behind himself while keeping on good terms with the jingos of his party. Embarrassed over the letter, Ambassador Delome resigned. Then on February 15th, just six days later, the main exploded in Havana Harbor and sank. 260 sailors were lost. Assistant Secretary of the Navy Theodore Roosevelt called the sinking of the Maine an act of dirty treachery on the part of the Spaniards, and he claimed that the United States needs a war. So what caused the ship to sink? On March 28th, a Naval Court of Inquiry reported that an external mine had set off an explosion in the ship's munitions magazine. The actual cause is disputed at this day. Some claim that a mine exploded the ship while others argue that a coal, bank, coal bunker exploded inside the ship. The actual cause doesn't matter, for the Americans had to blame somebody, and the easy target was the Spanish. Remember the Maine became a rally cry. Yes, they stole it from the Texans. Spain called for a settlement in order to maintain peace. This is almost paramount to waving the white flag. It also announced a unilateral ceasefire, in early April, an early rebellion. On April 10th, the new Spanish ambassador to the United States gave the State Department a message that amounted to surrender. The message stated <coughs> that Cuba would have its own government, and the question over what sunk the USS Maine would go into arbitration. This is all too late, as the Americans had decided to go to war. On April 11th, McKinley asked Congress for, for power to use the armed forces in Cuba to protect U.S. property and trade. Congress then declared Cuba independent on April 20th and demanded a withdrawal of Spanish forces in Cuba. The Teller Amendment, passed on the same day, stated that the United States did not want Cuban territory. Two days later, they announced a blockade of Cuba. Faced with an ultimatum, Spain declared war on the United States on April 25th. But determined to be first, Congress also declared war on Spain on April 25th, but this declaration of war was retroactive to the 21st. There were two reasons for war. Too much momentum and popular pressure had built up to, for a confidential message to change the course of events. Leaders of the business community were demanding a quick resolution to the problem in their favor. McKinley could have argued for peace, but the political risk was too high. And finally, public opinion was overwhelmingly in favor of war. Secretary of State John Hay called it a splendid little war. The war lasted for just 114 days, just enough time for the United States to raise an army and get to the island. The Navy blockaded the Spanish at Santiago, which is on the southern coast of Cuba. Although the Army asked for only 50,000 men, over 170,000 men volunteered. Among those who fought for the United States included six regiments of African American soldiers, who were called the Buffalo Soldiers from their campaigns in the Old West against Native Americans. Men from the Buffalo Soldiers received five medals of honor from their actions in the Spanish-American War. As soon as the United States declared war on Spain, the Assistant Secretary of the Navy, Theodore Roosevelt, ordered Commodore George Dewey to engage the Spanish fleet in the Philippines. Dewey captured Manila Bay on April 30th with four cruisers and two gunboats. They, the United States destroyed or captured all the Spanish warships in the war, in the bay. The Spanish lost 381 men, while Dewey lost only eight men. Dewey did not expect this to happen, so he did not have the occupation force to take the city. Thus, he remained in Manila Bay while he waited for reinforcements. This kept the British and the Germans from swooping in and taking the territory. And once American troops arrived, Dewey entered Manila on August 13th. 
the Philippines belonged to the United States. Meanwhile, right after he gave the order to Dewey to engage the Spain in the Philippines, Roosevelt quit the Navy Department. He stopped, he left D.C., took a train to New York, stopped at Brooks Brothers, and purchased a custom-made Army uniform. Then Roosevelt caught the next train out of New York, headed to Texas, and formed the Rough Riders, officially known as the 1st Volunteer Cavalry, at the Minger Hotel Bar in San Antonio. Now the Rough Riders, not to be confused with the baseball team, was composed of Ivy League athletes, ex-convicts, Indians, and Southwestern sharpshooters, what I like to call a motley crew. Now, recent, now appointed Lieutenant Colonel, Theodore Roosevelt was second in command of the Rough Riders, while his friend, Colonel Leonard Wood, led the regiment. Colonel Wood was a medic. When they arrived in Cuba, after stopping in Tampa, only Roosevelt had a horse. Now, this is a cavalry unit that requires horses. Thus, in Cuba, the Rough Riders had become what George Brown Tyndall calls the Weary Walkers. The Spanish-American War on the Cuban front centered on the town of Santiago on the southern coast. coast. Although the Rough Riders are credited with the charge up San Juan Hill, they actually walked up Kettle Hill. T.R. claimed that he would rather have led the charge up that hill, and he's meaning San Juan here, than have served three terms in the U.S. Senate. <coughs> San Juan Hill was taken with a much greater force, larger force. With the capture of the hills around Santiago, Santiago was in place under siege. The army held the hills, the navy held the bay. On July 3rd, the Spanish fleet tried to escape, but they were no match for the newer and faster American fleet. Over 474 Spanish ship, Spanish soldiers and sailors were killed and wounded, while another 1,750 were taken prisoner. For the Americans, they suffered one death and one wound. By this point, it's obvious the Spanish are clearly outmatched in this war. The Spanish mobilized 278,000 men in the Spanish-American War. The United States mobilized over 300,000. Over 13,000 Spanish soldiers died of disease or wounds. Of the Americans, just over 3,000 deaths. Only 379 Americans in battle died, as most of them succumbed. Excuse me of that. Only 379 Americans died in battle, as mostly come to diseases such as malaria, <coughs> dysentery, typhoid, and yellow fever. The peace treaty was signed on December 10, 1898. This is the Treaty of Paris of 1898. The terms of peace, according to an armistice declared on August 12th, dictated that Spain give up Cuba, Puerto Rico, and the Philippines. Now, the United States had taken Puerto Rico from, a, from minor resistance on July 25th and now acquired it for new territory. The Philippines posed a bigger question. Spain transferred control of it to the United States expecting the United States to grant it self-rule. This did not happen. As you might expect, most Democrats, populists, and some Republicans opposed the Treaty of Paris of 1898. These were the anti-imperialists. They argued that acquiring the Philippines would undermine democracy. Things these anti-imperialists stressed, traditional isolationism, American principles of self-government, an inconsistency of liberating Cuba and annexing the Philippines. Why are you? F These guys asked, why is the United States freeing one nation but not freeing the other? And then the anti imperialists also expressed concerns that the Philippines would be impossible to defend. And in December 1941, the Japanese proved them correct. 
Also, the anti-imperialists stressed, involvement in foreign entanglements would undermine the logic of the Monroe Doctrine. Now, the Monroe Doctrine, if you see if you guys remember it from History 1301, proclaimed that the European powers could not colonize or interfere with the affairs of nations in the Western Hemisphere. And to the anti-imperialists, what is the United States doing here? Interfering. <coughs> the Treaty of Paris passed after William Jennings Bryan, who is an anti-imperialist, influenced the vote for approval. Bryan argued that ending the war would clear the way to Cuban and Filipino independence. That's his reason for, it, for agreeing to this treaty. Ratification to the treaty came on February 6, 1899, with a margin of one vote more than necessary than the two-thirds needed in the U.S. Senate. The significance of the Spanish-American War. The war launched the United States onto the world scene as a world power and into a colonial power. The United States liberated Spain's colonies, yet it would substitute Spanish oppression with its own. It also placed the United States in the middle of problems in the Philippines and created new ones in the 20th century. Thank you for watching this video assignment on the Spanish-American War, and may the force be with you.